Welcome to Healthcare Entrepreneurs. I'm John Lynn, the founder of healthcarescene.com, and I have my partner in crime with me, Melissa McCool. How are you doing, Melissa? I'm doing well. Well, John, yeah. thank you. She's the uh, founder of, and I don't know which brand do you like, STI, or do you like Mindsight, or do you like Stellacare? She, I mean, she's found, she's like, no, she's like no, me. No, it's STI Innovations. STI yeah, Innovations? So All right, that's what you like. She, she, she's trying to be like me and, and see how many brands she can uh, found in the same no, company. No, no, <laughs> I'm not, I'm no, we're not doing that anymore, no more. Uh, I think we just found a future topic, it's a uh, branding for entrepreneurs. How right? many brands, how many brands or too many brands, yeah. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks to everyone that's joined live and to our special guest who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, if you're watching live, you've never used Blab, if you like what we're saying, you can click on your face and it you know, gives what we call props. So feel free to do that and on the left you can tweet It'll do an animated GIF and share it out with your uh, social followers. You can also post to Facebook. I'm going to do one now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Please welcome. make sure that it's a flattering one, John. You have this habit of catching the most unflattering screenshots ever. <laughs> it's not my no, fault. Let's, let's make a couple faces and he can do it. Let's, you know, we're like, it's recording. <laughs> Of course, Mandy would go straight to the tongue one. Of course. <laughs> it's like Kiss. She's a, she's a member of Kiss. Oh, <laughs> Mandy didn't catch that, but. Oh, oh well. I'm sure that there will be another opportunity. I mean, it's going to be an hour conversation. <laughs> That's true. So, yeah, if you're joining, uh, feel free to tweet it. Also, if you have questions for anyone, uh, put slash Q for questions. And we do have an open seat. So if anyone wants to hop on, if Shim, uh, I know uh, Steve Sisko's on, and uh, he, I'm sure he has some insights. Uh, but I know he's on a work call. Feel free to just call in. We'll add you. Uh, no hey, problem John. With other people, especially uh, people that know about hymns and want to share some insights. So, uh, you know, I guess I should introduce our special guest. Really, she needs no introduction. If you are on Blab, then you certainly know at Mandy B. Pro. Uh, oh, wait, is that your real name? Wait, oh, no, her real name is Mandy <laughs> Bishop. She's the uh, Health Ant Plan Analytics Innovation Practice Lead, which is one heavy mouthful at Dell Healthcare. Uh, so she, she, I, I prefer to call her affectionately a healthcare data nerd, but she's Indeed. also... Let me do a proper intro for this. This meetup seems like it needs a proper intro. She's also the queen of social media networking and really networking in general at Hymns. I mean, when I went with her to the first Hymns, and you know, I, she was actually blogging for me at the time uh, that she went. I was just am amazed at how many people came up to me and said, have you seen what Mandy's been doing? And so that's why I knew Mandy had to be here for this, uh, this uh, lab to talk about networking at Hymns. How's that? That, was, for, that was a fantastic. Mandy. Thank you. That was a fantastic intro. And, and at that Hymns, I actually, people were asking what I was doing because I was the only person who got put in Twitter jail during that, <laughs> during that conference. And it was what all is, Wen's fault. Twitter jail is if you tweet more than 2,000 times a day, if you send out more than 2,000 tweets in any given day, then you go to Twitter jail and they actually lock, lock your account down for a period of time. Oh my God, that is awesome. I didn't even know. How could you, were you just like recording like every little unconscious thought that popped into your brain? Essentially. You said, I just got a drink. I just walked down the hall. No, I am not one of those people. No, nor I, nor do I do that on Facebook. But Let's no, it, honest, of the two thousand tweets, how many of them were selfies? I think at least half. Probably half. Probably half. Especially in the, the first the, the first couple of years. But then I hashtagged it after the second year, right? So now him selfies has become like that's that's my tag, man. That is that is my jam. I am all about the him selfies because I think that it's important to put a visual. So yeah, with, with with every memory as much as possible. So what's the benefit of the hymn selfie? That's actually the perfect intro to networking at hymn sixteen, right? Like, what's the benefit you've seen of taking a selfie with people? Other than the fact that it gives me something to hound Farzad about on a regular basis, <laughs> um, yeah, it's well, it it helps you first. It it gives you an in to create an opportunity to network where you might not have otherwise believed one exists, right? So selfies are something that, that have become socially acceptable. It's okay for us to try to take a selfie and it's okay for us to ask for a picture with our heroes. And this gives us a really nice, easy 
entree into a conversation with someone that you might not have otherwise had, um, you know, felt that you had the, the cloud or the ability to, to talk to. It's become a thing to take a selfie. So the power of the him selfies, if you do nothing else this year, go up to one of your heroes and ask to take a selfie. And, and that opens the door to a conversation that you might not ever otherwise have had. Okay, yeah. so Mandy, how would you do that? Because when John and I started talking about networking, no, yeah. really, because yeah. a lot of people, like clearly you're very extroverted, you're very outgoing. So for you, it's easy, but for somebody who's a little more reserved, like how would you even broach that? Like, oh, I love you, I wanna take a selfie with you? I, like how, how does exactly one- how she does it. That is, exactly, <laughs> yeah, that is exactly what I do. Um, it, it's funny, because John and I were talking a little bit about this earlier, and I told him I, I don't know how to answer these questions very well because I I am so extroverted. It's, it's challenging for me to try to imagine how I would approach the same situation otherwise. But um, it is likely that if you, so, so I can give one example. If you're there with someone else, right? So if you're, if you are there with um, another one of your coworkers, if you're there with a, a collaborator, if with a partner in crime, um, perhaps that person would be more likely to ask to take an ussy or a selfie, you know, on, on your behalf. And then you're part of the conversation. So you might have an opportunity to bring other people into that mix that you're comfortable with and have them do your dirty work for you and open that door. And actually, you know, it's, it's like having a warm introduction in any sales process, right? It's always best if you're able to have someone else make the connection on your behalf. So if you're not comfortable reaching out on your own and, and making that connection or asking for a selfie or, um, in my case, sometimes asking for phone numbers, like it, it, it would get that blatant, right? It was just, I, I wanted to make connections with people and, and, um, and that's, I don't know, but other than that, other than if you don't have someone specifically with you to help you kind of bridge that gap, I, I would be curious what you and John think and what you guys would suggest. Well, I guess what the thing that popped into my, <laughs> by the way, anybody else who wants to jump in, jump in in the fourth C, because it would be good to hear some other voices. But yeah. for me, like the little I've known of you, if you were to come up and say, I want a selfie and you, you're so exuberant and you know jolly that I'm sure everyone laughs and giggles and there's a selfie and it works for you. But it's almost like people have to be who they are. Yeah. So other, somebody else, it wouldn't be, authentic and it would seem sort of contrived and awkward like with you it's probably not awkward but i can imagine i i don't even i'm trying to think who we all know in common where it would be like if they at, went up to someone and asked for a selfie it would be just not right yeah, yeah. so different people but we better not name them uh <laughs> like, like that guy tech guy like if he did it you know I'm, <laughs> that weirdo yeah i, I really don't know about him he's a creepy guy coming up to me. well that is actually interesting right like if i went up to mandy and said and i didn't know her and said can i have a selfie she'd say what's this creepy guy doing trying no. to have a selfie with me you no know, but no but mandy that's a very you know that's John, actually that's true like there's gender differences too. That's true. Meaning for an extroverted female who's cute and who's exuberant to go ask for a selfie, if you have, you know, the, um, I don't know what the right way of saying, if you have the courage to do that, it works for you. But like for a guy, you're right. Like, I don't know. It might, it might be. Yeah. If I, if it was someone that I had no, I, well, I say that um, I've had that happen and, and I did not, find it creepy but again i think every you know to each to each his or her own right there might be um there might be perceived negative connotations in either you know for either gender and either respect so that's it could be it depends on the situation Dep well, to me it depends how well you know the person right or yeah how you approach them right but i i will know, yeah yeah go ahead no no that's it's fine no, I was just going to say, so I guess we know there are gender differences, personality differences, and maybe maybe age differences, possibly. Well, I let mean me tell a story about that. So I was, uh, uh, I was going to a, from one of the hymns uh, evening events, otherwise known as parties, uh, and I was going actually from uh, this event with this CEO uh, which, you know, I don't mind na naming names. That was Dana Sellers, who actually I'm doing a blab with next week. But uh, anyways, so she's been in healthcare IT since like the punch card days or, you know, <laughs> something like that. Like she's been around forever. She's so smart. Like I love being, you know, talking to her. But anyway, so we were after her party, actually, and we were both leaving and uh, we were both headed to the same place. So we said, hey, why don't we share a cab? 
And we said, sure, no problem. So we, we ended up sharing the cab. And when we were there, I started joking with Dana. And I said, hey, Dana, we need to take a selfie. She's like, a selfie? <laughs> she, I think at the time she didn't even know what a selfie was, right? Like, or she'd maybe heard of it, you know, maybe, you know, but she definitely had never taken it. I, I asked her, I said, have you ever taken a selfie before? And she said, no, this will be my first. I said, okay, I'm your selfie virgin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, so, so anyways, we took the selfie. Of course, the battery was low. I didn't have a flash. It was awful. It was like this crazy first selfie experience that she was like, this is awful. So interestingly enough now, every time I see her, we say, let's take a selfie. It's almost become like the thing. It's become she, your thing. Well, she's this older lady, right? Uh, you know, that's not into selfies, you know, you know, barely understands what they are. I'm sure now she does, but um. my my daughter says that about me, though. I'm this older lady who's into selfies, <laughs> sadly, and yeah. <laughs> but yeah. no, I mean, it was great. It created this interesting connection point now with us, and I tweeted it out, and then her PR person was like, "I can't believe you were hanging with my CEO," and right. you know, it was, she she loved it, right? And so it was a. Uh, it was a great connection point. You know, I mean, to me, I've actually seen nobody wants an autograph anymore. They want a selfie, right? It's replaced the autograph. Yeah. Which is kind of thing. yeah. Well, and I think, I think what Melissa was trying to drive at and what's, what's interesting, and I, I would be curious to know, what are some alternatives? I think this whole conversation started with the joking about the selfies and then you asking, you know, how I would, <laughs> how, what is the positive benefit of the selfie? But it's certainly not the only way to get to know people and to reach out and to begin to establish or to deepen your network when you're at Hims or any other show, but particularly at Hims, which is so massive. I mean, it's just 40,000 people. It is absolutely massive. And yeah, so what are, what are some other good strategies? And particularly, I'd be interested to know, John, what you would have to recommend for people who are not extroverted in nature. Am I an introvert? I no, <laughs> no. But I, since I since I warned you earlier today that I was going to put this that question back to you, <laughs> yeah. 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 So I mean, I think there are. I mean, I think actually having the strategy of go ask them for a selfie if it's someone that you that's famous, you know. But I don't think you go up like Mandy would, which is you're awesome and I'm you're cool, and, you know, with that kind of energy. Instead, you go up with a, an approach that's more. Hey, I, I respect so much the work you're doing. I really liked this blog post you did, or I really like this initiative. You know, you know, I really respect you, and I wondered, you know, could we take a selfie? I mean, just having that simple strategy that says let's take a selfie creates a new relation. You know, that intro that says, hey, let me talk to him, which I think that you wouldn't do otherwise, right? Because where does the conversation go after you say, hey, I respect what you're doing, and I'd love to meet you, right? Like, you know, at least having you know that strategy is is a good idea. Um, I, I think, you know, it's interesting, Mandy kind of talked about having a second person with you. Uh -huh. And I think that actually provides a real value. And, and during the Health IT Chicks uh, chat, they talked about how do you, if you're searching for a job, what are the strategies you use for, to, in order to be able to find a job? And it looks like Shimko is actually talking about the same thing. Yeah, have a wing person. Yeah. Exactly. Having a wing person is, is really, really valuable because... Uh, you know, having that person there validates, okay, this is someone I should talk to and I should be comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're searching for a job, it's great because they can validate, hey, this person's really smart. And, you know, like you should spend some time talking to them. Um, well, also, but I think it opens doors. Go ahead, Miss. If you, if you have a, if you have someone with you, you're less likely to be anxious. So if somebody is more shy or introverted, just having that other person there might help them a little bit to sort of manage their own sort of internal narrative when they start to get nervous or what have you. But I think what you're, the selfie for you is your way of connecting with them. So I think that's the key thing is how could you connect? Like maybe figuring out, and it might be individualized. Like if you're a shy person or introverted and the idea of a selfie even, you know, for some people that's not serious enough for them or they, right. you know what, and so it might just be, here's this other person, what is it right this second that I could connect with them about that we have in common and kind of individualize perhaps, you know? So, you know, I've found a few strategies. I mean, so to me, the other is how do you, how do you spark any sort of conversation, right? Uh, you know, so my approach has always been, you know, you walk up to the table where there's a few people standing and the key is you have to find people that aren't already talking, right? Because if they're right. already talking, it's hard to interrupt that conversation. Right. But even that initial, can I, can I set my plate here? 
it starts the initial conversation and then they look at you. And then once you've set that down and they say, yeah, sure. You know, you, so you just engage with, with a simple question we all can ask, right? Can I sit here? Can I use this corner of your table or whatever? Once you have that initiated, then you just say, you know, you look at their badge and you say, Hey, Melissa, what do you do? So I, and you know, I, and then it starts. And I have a story about doing exactly that. I, I accidentally crashed the speaker's table at one of the very first conferences that I went to for healthcare big data. So I went to the Strata RX conference, the, the inaugural Strata RX in uh, San Francisco. And I had not met everybody. I didn't know who these people were. Like, you know, being able to participate on a, on a national scale in this type of conversation was not, it, it was new to me. And so I wanted to be as close to the stage as I could be. And I just went and I found a round table and it had two seats and I sat down and I looked across and it turns out I was sitting with Tim O'Reilly and Vinod Kushla and Esther Dyson. I had no idea. I had absolutely no clue that I had just crashed the speaker's table, but because I just asked I could sit there and I sat down and started making conversations and, um, and Dr. Bonnie Feldman as well. And, and that ended up being one of, yeah, and it was just because, like you said, John, it was a, a perfectly reasonable request, like, can I sit here? And it just, yeah, you know, the conversation that was happening at the table, I, I just kind of managed to weave my way in, and about five minutes after I sat down, realized what a huge mistake I had made, and, and that I was horrified. But uh, they were they were fantastic, and, and I made lifelong connections, so. Hmm. You know what, so, actually, Shimko made a suggestion that he said you could tell him you're on a photo safari and you're collecting pictures. I think that's good because you could say, let me, I'm just taking pictures of various people. And, and then when you put it down, you could say, no, you know, tell me a little bit about you so that I know who I'm taking a picture of. I mean, you could do that. Like for someone who's, again, more shy, that could be a good entree. So I don't you, you have to hear the story of a, a, a lady named Amanda. Uh, she worked at Graythorn at the time. She switched companies now. I forget her new company, uh, and I always slaughter her last name. But uh, she created what she called the Hymns Yearbook. And so it was a book that she would yep. take around and have people sign, right? Like, and so she was all over Twitter with Hymns Yearbook saying, hey, come and sign my yearbook, right? Yeah. Um, which, but you know, you know what? that's a brilliant idea, actually. It, well, it worked it, really well. That's such, see, that sounds more comfortable to me in a way because it's hard to, it, you have to, again, I think you have to be who you are. And if you're not Mandy B. Pro, you know, you have to figure out a way that would work. So, I mean, I don't know that. I mean, that also has, it's a, there's a cheese element to that. But it's yeah. kind of a fun, you know, signing your yearbook. You're back in high school. It's and I know it is, but let me, I mean, so like high school, I'm, I'm Amanda is this really attractive female. I mean, it goes back to the gender roles as well, right? But, you know, you know, I, I'm not sure if I did it, I would have the same reaction, right? Like, <laughs> you know, that's a... I don't, I don't know how that would, the reaction would be the same. It's kind of like, I mean, it's called a yearbook, right? Who do you want the yearbook signed by? You want it by the head cheerleader, the hot girl that you were in love with, right? Like, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know if it would work the same if, you know, so I think that's one of the challenges, but you know, it, yeah, it could work for some people. Well, and right. I think that what we're talking about here is, is we're, we're talking about personal networking in a way and, and personal networking can definitely, you know, can definitely lead to a much deeper professional understanding and, and you know, um, opportunities. But I wonder, is there a difference in the way that you approach someone? Like for, for me, um, when I'm at HIMSS and when I'm at networking events, I'm much more kind of on, I guess, and, and hyped and, and much more energetic than I am in a, like a purely professional setting where you don't have all of these additional opportunities for, you know, for food and for drink and, and, and all those things. So, but there's both at HIMSS, right? And there are people who are purely interested in making business connections and business connections only and who don't necessarily want, like you, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely that way. Um, is there a way that you, you guys would differentiate the approach from a networking perspective for those, like what is the end goal of the networking? Is it just to make connections for connection's sake? Which is for a lot of us, that's, I mean, there's value in having a connection regardless of the direction that, that connection takes. But you know, do you think that there might be a differentiation in a, in a networking strategy depending upon what the outcome is intended to be? Right. That, I mean, I think that's an interesting idea, meaning if you have an agenda versus not having an agenda. 
Yeah. So if you're going just, I, I think if you don't have an agenda, it's probably much easier because you're in a way you're just getting to know someone as a person and you're just, it's like being at any other party. And some people like parties and some people don't. And some people get overwhelmed and some people don't. And like, we're talking about hymns, but the mm -hmm. truth is this could be applied to any conference. I mean, sure. I mean and actually we started talking about it because John and I, I was saying in going to hymns, well, first of all, I'm not really, I'm sort of getting more into health IT, but historically I haven't been, and I really won't know anybody. And my kind of general MO when I go to conferences is to go to the conference, to listen to the speakers and to go back you know, and to my room. Take your feet up, a little bit of Oprah. Like, I don't know why. I just like, it's intimate. I don't know if it's intimidating, but so many people, I, I, it's, I, I don't know. I get overwhelmed a little bit. It's like going into Ikea. Like some people love Ikea and some people want to go to Ikea and they want to get, you know, their $20, furniture that it's going to take them five hours to assemble and you know they want to pay their five bucks for the 20 you know and they want to be done and some people really love it there and they want to eat the meatballs and look around i don't know so i think it's a question of how you do that and if there's somebody you want to meet how would you even approach that i think i would think the strategy would be a little different wouldn't you i mean john you know better than i do and any i think it is on the line is for sure right I mean, because the, the, the interesting challenge for me is in the, the work that I do, largely, especially at HIMSS, everyone that I meet is potentially someone valuable because they could provide content, they could be a reader, or they could be an advertiser. And in many cases, they could be all three. Right. So, you know, I have a skewed view because everyone I meet is potentially any of those three, uh, you know, so, so I, I think it's a challenge for me. So I'd have to, you know, for me, I go back more towards like, if I go to a CES or if I go to some other, uh, you know, South by Southwest where I meet some people and, you know, you run into the person, you know, I, yeah, perfect case. I was at CES when I was on the bus, of course, I struck up the conversation with the guy next to me, which took a little bit of work which is, you know, I guess the challenge of networking, right, is, is really getting the conversation going because I think most people are okay once you start it. Um, I found out the guy, would he essentially would go around and find products to put on QVC and HSN and, or whatever, those the shopping networks, and he that was his job was to wow. essentially – Really? On between the products and, and <laughs> look at Randy, like her little yeah. eyes lit up. Really, really, yeah. <laughs> yeah like that that would be really interesting to do. <laughs> exactly. So I was interested just in the process, and so I mean, from a pure uh, human element, right? But yeah. there was zero value to the business, right? I mean, the the closest I come is my TV blogs that that have, uh, you know, that, you know, I, and I haven't written about Shark Tank much, but, you know, like, you know, it's like, that's the closest I've come. But, you know, so, you know, once that happens, it was like, oh, well, this conversation isn't nearly as interesting to me. You know, I'd rather be talking to someone else, right, that has more relations. So right. I think it's something about the targeting that really uh, changes things. And certainly there's some people at HIMSS that are more interesting than others. In fact, one of the questions we, you know, we kind of threw out there, you know, before we did this is, you know, how do you stop a conversation with someone that's not a great fit, right? I mean, have you ever been stuck in a conversation where you're like, oh my gosh, if this guy keeps talking, I'm going to shoot myself, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I just, you know, and maybe you don't go that far, but you're just like, I really don't care, you know? Like, <laughs> Well, and beyond that, I mean, you really do have to think about your networking um, as a time management opportunity, right? So you, yep. especially at a, at a big show like HIMSS or CES, but HIMSS with 40,000 people and the opportunity, if you're in this space and you want to continue to do work in this space, to meet, you know, 40,000 people and to, and each one of those connections may be your next job. They meet, may be your next um, they may be your next client. Like you said, they may be your next reader, your next audience. In some way, shape or form, everyone you meet might impact your future career opportunities um, or your future offerings. If you're if you're an entrepreneur, they might impact your future sales. How do you effectively negotiate exiting those conversations? Because it does happen to me pretty often. And, and I've 
I, I have some tricks that I have to employ, and they're very similar to the tricks that I would use when I was dating and you know had to have the emergency call to get away from the the bad date, right? Um, but okay. yeah. yeah, I mean, man, that's so entertaining. <laughs> like I when it comes, yeah, I really want to talk about that. Like that just she almost started I'm, a blog about her experiences on Match.com. I did. I Oh, that would be hilarious. I did, John. It's actually still live. I'll give you the link to it. It's still, it's just kind of varied. But yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. it was really fun. I did so, it. You know, it's yeah. you know, at, at Shimcode actually posted some tips. Uh, you know, actually, for, he also does the account at HIT Conf Guy, which covers uh, conference ones. Uh, he posted this one. He said, how to gracefully exit a conversation that's going nowhere. This one he called the plan. So he, he posted a bunch of these. This was my favorite one. This is the plan. He says, please let me know how that project goes. I'd love to see it and hear how it turns out. Have you seen anyone from company name You know, tonight? I've been meaning to chat with them. <laughs> so that was his two hits. What is your, like, essentially you're ending the conversation by saying, wow, let me know how that project goes. Like, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, then you are forced to follow up with that person or you're forced to accept a phone call or the next follow up that, that happens. Or, or at least you kind of you kind of set yourself up for that. You set yourself up for additional conversation where you may not have any interest in it, right? So it's like getting yeah. a guy on if you're dating. You're leading, you know, leading the guy on. You're leading that conversation person on. Um, yeah. You know what's funny? I have to tell you guys, I for some reason, I don't know why it makes me feel sad when I hear about that. Cause I think about these people and no, and not sad, but, but maybe that's not quite the right term, but I think about how that impacts that other person. Mm -hmm. I know, I, I know that sounds, I think it's true. That, you know, yeah. I just feel like, gosh, you know, cause I, as, as a therapist, I know how many people have is like social anxiety. And so I think, gosh, they worked up the courage and, there, I, you know, so yeah. I have to just, yeah, but I think if you do it at the right lull in the conversation, right. And you know, they probably want to get out of it as well if it's not a great fit. Right. I mean, if you think about it selfishly that way, you know, and kind of be like, well, if, if it's not a great fit for you, it's not going to be a great fit for them and you're wasting their time. I mean, that's why the other one's even better. You know, have you seen anyone from, you know, from Dell tonight? No, I've been meaning that, to chat no. with them. But you know what? I guess what I'm getting at, and again, you guys have to, It's this is super helpful for me personally, but I have to think it would be helpful for other people, is I think the way you guys are approaching it is different fundamentally from the way I've ever approached it. So for me, when I go, I just fundamentally approach like, who do I want to meet as a person? Right. And it's and not strategic. And so I think what you're getting at is if you want to be strategic, by definition, you're going to have to reject some people. You can't do kumbaya because that's my my thing is like, oh, everyone's welcome. I'll talk to anybody. I can't wait. I love everybody. And you can't be kumbaya at a big conference like that. I mean, you can, but you're yeah. not going to optimize. So it's, it's almost like a different way of viewing a conference. And again, maybe I'm just naive and other people don't view it like this, but so the, the quantity of time that's available to invest in the conversations is definitely finite, right? And and so there's certain opportunities and you have to make sure you take advantage of this opportunity to simply exist and to enjoy the space that you're in and the people that you're with, regardless of you know, with, without without intent. Right? right. So that's just connecting organically for the sake of connecting with whomever happens to to be in that space for you at that time. But there are um you know, if you are if you are there to network to achieve an objective, right? So if you're trying to if you're looking for another job, if you want advancement in your current opportunities, your current company, and you need to be able to network with your executives and those kinds of things. New um, customers. Yeah, you're ex exactly, and it's it is very challenging, and, and it does make you feel bad. And I think honestly, Melissa, as as women, we might have a harder time with this concept of walking away from a conversation that's not necessarily a good fix. It is, it's, it is a type of rejection and talking like it, you know, talking about it this way, it sounds like a social rejection, but it's, it's really just, it's you know, not, a, time, a time management strategy, no, you know? No, it's not at all, but it's funny. It's, it's interesting for me to kind of notice my sort of instinct to care give. I mean, right. it's ridiculous. It's like, it's not, and again, it might be a gender thing. It might be a personality thing. And so it's just it's just another little wrinkle. 
it's, it's hard. It, it is. You know, it's hard for guys too, but I mean, the, the challenge is everyone wants to talk to you too. So, I mean, that's a, you know, with guys that, that, that no one wants to talk to me, people I mean, don't want to come up to you and talk, it. right? Depending on the situation. So, I mean, maybe that there's a supply and demand issue too, right? There's a lot of people that want to demand your time versus few, right? I mean, that, that you, you see that it's a lot of the conferences, right? Uh, there's certain people that everyone wants to talk to and other people that, you know, they aren't getting people to come and talk to them. So that's a challenge. How do we involve those people in the conversation? So that's a, that's a question. And I think that that's the kind of the perpetual, my, my daughter has this band bowling for soup and they, and high school never ends is one of the songs that, that they have. And the yeah. song cracks me up. Yeah. High, high school never, it's so true. High school never ends. Yeah, right. I was to ask you when you said, is it like, so someone's carrying around their yearbook, so that's sort of the high school. Is there a high school vibe going on? And is there a high school vibe in general at conferences? I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, there must it be. Depends on the conference. Too. Yeah. What? Depends on the conference, too. Looks like we lost Mandy, but, uh, you know, it depends on the conference, right? Yeah, I think at a small conference like uh, the HITMIC conference, you know, the conference I organize, it's small enough that, that people are pretty opening and welcoming uh, you know, although, you know, as it expands, the question is, how do you maintain that kind of intimate feel as it grows bigger? You know, at HIMSS, I think there's all these sub conferences, right? So when you go to a sub networking event at HIMSS, you, you may be in the insider, you may be an outsider, right? You know, and, and that may change from party to party that you go to, right? Right. You know, so if I go to my new media meetup, right? people are very social. Everyone knows me because I organized it. And, you know, or if I go to any of the social media meetups, they largely know me. Right. And so then, you know, it, I'm, I guess I'm part of the click. Right. But if I go to a customer event for a customer where I don't know that many people, then I feel like I'm the guy left out and nobody knows me and, and things like that. Um, which interestingly, I think social media has transformed my experience at conferences because when I look at especially the evening events where I think most of the networking happens, right? Or yeah. even in some of the sessions or whatnot, like I find out where my social media connections are and then I go to that event. And as I'm talking here, I'm realizing the reason why I love to go to the social media ones is because then I am part of the clique that, you know, like I'm part of the cool kids, right? Or it doesn't even part matter of the conversation. who you are. It, I'm part of a group of people that, you know, knows each other and cares about each other. Whereas if I go to some random event where I don't necessarily know anyone, uh, then I feel like the outcast, right? And so it, it's much more challenging. Uh, but the challenge for me in seeing this arc, right, is now it's like, okay, well, now am I just going and seeing the, the social media friends? And am I never pushing myself to meet people outside of that? Uh, right. You know, that's a huge challenge that I've been debating. Like, maybe I shouldn't go, you know. But the challenge goes back to kind of what you said, Melissa, is that sometimes you just want to live in your element, right? And you want to sit in your element and live in it and, and uh, be able to enjoy it rather than always being focused on work. Like is that yours? Is that yours, John? Yeah, it sounds like they're back from the library. <laughs> I was like, are my boys fighting again? Oh, good. It's your kids. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Yeah. Actually, as you were speaking, though, I thought of another way that someone else could approach. Remember you said if you want to go meet somebody and how what would the entree be and you do the selfie? The other thing would be, hey, I'm going to be tweeting because pretty much everyone who's here is probably on Twitter and probably active. I'm going to be tweeting some things, and I'm just curious, what is the most interesting observation that you've had being here or the most surprising thing about Hems? Or I just want to get a little feedback. You know, I, I want to tweet some stuff out, anything that you want to, I don't know, maybe almost like an interview or just like a little question, like an interesting question that would get them to open up, and that might be a way to connect. Like to me, that feels more like something you might do. Yeah, definitely don't be something disingenuous, right? So I think that that would be really interesting. And you might you might find commonalities to continue the conversation through that type of an interview approach or even even just the, the initial question. Um, but I, so, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so good, to, that John's idea with social media transforming it, you could bring in social media as a way, almost like as a buffer between you and this person, that that could be like, conduit to sort of connecting with them. 
and it's much easier to do it online than it is in person, right? And that opens up the door to the in-person. And really, let's be honest, if you're on social media, people think, oh, I should just broadcast. I'm looking for customers and somehow the customers are just going to come to me because I said, I want customers, I have a solution. I'm at this booth, I'm at this booth, come to my booth. Yeah, I'm at this booth and somehow you're gonna come to me, the right people at the right time. No, I mean, you have to do the research into the right social media people and then reach to the, out to them and connect to them, just like you said, Melissa, that you, sh- you have to engage them and ask them questions, care about them. And then you've got a relationship which then says, oh, let's meet up you know, for coffee, for, at a party, at a session, whatever, right? Um, you have to engage them. Social media is about being social. It's not about broadcasting whatever you want, right? Right. Right. Well, and then there's, I mean, so let's take it back to even more traditional networking, right? Outside of the social media space, if you're at HIMSS and you're walking the floor, right? Say you're walking the exhibit hall floor and you happen to see someone that you would really like to introduce yourself to or to meet, where are they? What are they looking at? What are they, you know what I mean? Like what, what booth are they stopped at? What are they checking out? And then if you're able to walk up and make a comment, if you're able to make a relevant comment on the thing that they are checking out at that moment, that, that gives you an entree for conversation and you can bypass you know, any of the other you know, shtick, right? So if, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm all for, I, I'm all for having a, you know, a straightforward path for people who might not be comfortable having a more scripted approach, but you know, it can be as simple as just be observant about what the person that you're trying to talk to, what are they interested in? What are they looking at? You know, what booth, what booth did they go to out of all the, you know, thousands of booths that are available? Why are they stopped at this one? And are they looking at something that you also have an interest in? Do you have something relevant to say and add to that conversation? And, and then, you know, easy to ask. Big connecting. Yeah. Yeah. Is, yeah. Do people ever make mistakes? Like what, what would be like a big mistake? Like I can think of when I've been at a few conferences, there's some people who they drink too much. No, I'm not kidding. And oh, they, yeah. they, does that, like, what do you guys think would be like the top kind of three mistakes that people make? I touched Farzad's bow tie. Don't do that. Don't, I don't, I don't recommend he did. And, and, and right, you know, rightfully so, right? I invaded personal space. Um, but, but, but like that. What do you say? Don't well, no, he was why. he was very gracious. He was very gracious about it, but he has since avoided me, kind of like the plague. So um, yeah, I, but, but the, I invaded. You know, and it's funny because in a reverse, talking about the gender the gender differences, right? If that had been a man touching a woman's clothing, then you know that might have been a um, a much more serious might have been considered a much more serious incident. So I think back on that, and it, it certainly wasn't intentional for me to be. Yeah, I wasn't trying to be creepy. I was just so overly excited to have the opportunity to meet him and to and to take this picture with him. Um, well, it has and I, that I did. Twitter account, so it is kind of its own. It, it, it is, and you know, but, but that was over the top. So I, I think that there's definitely there are definitely people who drink too much. There are definitely people who are overly exuberant, like like myself. I have the tendency to be overly exuberant, and I invade personal space and in that and that was a very specific example of how i invaded someone's personal space but um those are my those would be two of mine so i would define that as keeping it prof- uh, professional uh, you know keeping it professional and also knowing the boundaries with the person right because right. Right? Right. Yeah. some people it's fine right i mean if mandy comes up and gives me a hug that's totally fine in fact if she didn't i would be upset and wonder <laughs> what's wrong right but you know, if she did that to Farzad, he'd probably be like, who's this creepy lady? Mm-hmm. <laughs> by, this point, by this point, he knows. And he'll be like, I, I'm going to get a restraining order on you if you do this kind of thing again. <laughs> yeah, so it's understanding the relationship you have and, and maintaining those boundaries. Uh, uh, and then also keeping it professional, I think, is a, is maybe the other one, right? And, and knowing, you know, are people comfortable enough that you can go beyond just professional discussion right. into something else, right? Because uh, I think that happens a lot. I think, that, I think something else that people do pretty frequently that I find to be a turnoff from a networking perspective is, is you can get, um, we're all very passionate about particular topics. There are some people who get belligerent, right? And who can be passionate um, in a very negative sense and can, you know, there, there's a lot of very heated political debates around our topic, right? Healthcare is, is a very political, 
hotbed right now. And 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 you can have people who are literally screaming at each other. Like there are there are flame matches, flame wars that go on in hallways, and you'll see them sometimes in on um, you know on the panels. And for the panels, I think it's it's set up that way to be entertaining. But at networking events, sometimes you'll see people in corners who are literally screaming at each other. I, I don't ever want to aspire to be those people. Avoid those people at all costs. So no Jerry Springer. No Jerry Springer. No breaking chairs on other people. Right. Yeah. Having some boundaries. But see, you know what's interesting? Like there's passion in both of those. The exuberance and the sort of when you care so much about something. See, that's I think one end of the spectrum. I think on the other end, you could have people who don't take advantage of it. And see, that's where I would fall victim of that. Meaning they're either too intimidated, too nervous, too, they didn't plan. Because I think if you don't plan, I think if you're gonna really milk it, you have to plan. Who are you gonna talk to? Who are you gonna meet? And if you don't do that, you're just gonna, you know, I don't know, you might learn a little bit, but you're not really gonna get your money's worth. So I would say well, those are two ends of the spectrum. To some yeah. I I think that from a networking, how to plan your networking and how to optimize the networking at HIMSS, one of the best things that you can do is to plan. So you hit on something that's so critical. A lot of us um, don't, you know, maybe don't do the appropriate amount of research, right? And don't know who the players are in our space and don't maybe take the time to understand um, those, not just the key players, the, the key A-list players that we would see and, and would want to meet, would you know, readily recognize, but who are the other people in this industry that are making an impact who might be slightly behind the scenes, you know, and, and but really understand them and, and try to know a little bit about them so that when you do have an opportunity to meet these people or to network, um, you know at least a little bit about them, especially when you're when you're dealing with folks who are at a, a level of visibility that they would expect you to understand their entire life's history as well as every single line on their CV. You, you would be more successful if you have done some modicum of research to understand, at least from a professional standpoint, who they are and what they're about. Do they, yeah. do they publish like email? Like, do you do people know who's going to be attending? Is there? Does anybody find that out, or you just it's just sort of a surprise? And Hims is so massive. Um, I mean, so they publish they'll publish information about all of the speakers, right? So there will be speaker bios available, but you know, from an attendee standpoint. Yeah, you know, John. I, to the best of my knowledge, there's not like a, a list. However, there is a cool app for all hymns, hymns attendees, so you can look to see if somebody that you think is attending or that you believe you want to meet is actually there. And not only if they're there, but if they're using the app, this is a cool networking opportunity that you have now with the hymns app. You can actually look and see how to, um, you know, what they're doing. If they might have checked into a session, they may have, you know commented on something that's actually happening there at the conference. So it gives you an opportunity to network in a new way. Mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Looks like we lost John again. He keeps, he keeps bailing. I think he's got to go. He's, he's going to get, tuck his kids in maybe. <laughs> Five o'clock at, at 4.54. They're going to bed. That's, that's yeah. Good. Maybe, will, you know, they're, they're little. <laughs> exactly. I want them. I miss those days when I got to go to bed at five. I know, right? No. Yeah. no so, it, is this your first hymns? I well, is this is your first I've one. Never been to hymns, and uh, that's actually why we started talking about it. Because I thought there's got to be a way. I know that going to conferences, I'm sure there has to be some sort of proper way or the best way to sort of maximize. Um, and you know what? We should throw it out there. Does anybody out who's listening? First of all, do you want to jump on? Because it's easy. You just click in, and you're on. Or any questions, you can post questions over, um, I think it's like Q uh, forward slash or something to kind of ask any questions about like networking and what it means and what you're doing, um, you know, feel free. But this is the first hands. And I, the fact right. that there are so many people there and I, I need to figure out where to kind of start. Um, so someone's asking, Rich. <laughs> Okay. Our thoughts on digital health. <laughs> we have a lot of thoughts on that. Do you want to? That's what I was just thinking. I was like, well, my thoughts on digital health with respect to how to use leverage digital health as a topic of conversation for networking at HIMSS. I can definitely oh, yeah. kind of parlay that's that, good. right? Well, that's a good. Oh, oh, that's another idea, though. Okay, so digital health for networking at HIMSS. 
there's going to be so much conversation around around wearables and around what personalized healthcare means and how the digital you know, revolution is driving um, you know, personalized medicine through patient generated health data and and that's so if you see someone wearing a wearable right you might see um, Travis Broom for example is is now on um, Allidade staff he was at the ONC. He's just a fantastic individual, and he happened to have a Fitbit on last year. And so he and I became um, not just a connection point and an entree, but we actually had a little Fitbit contest for steps. But that kind of thing is another, you know, it, it's the old, I like your watch, except now instead of I like your watch, it's so oh, wearable. Is that a Fitbit? Is that a, you know, a jawbone? Is, you know, what is that? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. He's so post like, retweet something, follow. I don't. Um, someone is saying that. Oh, I think he. I think he might have accidentally posted. He might have accidentally posted in the wrong, uh, in the wrong window. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, but I like that that it, like integrating sort of the digital health, and that's a very very interesting, um, sort of way of connecting with people too. Just the wearables and what have you. Yeah, uh, and it's an entree to conversation, right? So you, it won't they won't all be wearing something but it is likely that some of the people that you would want to talk to will have a wearable of some kind on and visible on their body so somewhere mm -hmm. you can you know you can actually ask a question about it and then that that gives you an opportunity to start a conversation mm -hmm. now in terms of hymns if we're just talking about hymns what is one thing that people should not miss a party a speech a <laughs> breakfast a all of like, all of the above class like a is there is there a particular panel that you find really interesting right now I mean do you need to sign up in advance like how does this how does this work I um, okay so the parties typically yeah you know, the some of the parties are kind of invitation on invitation only they're smaller they're vendor driven his talk of Palooza which is put on by his talk is is always a fantastic party right it's an after hours networking event um, I have to give a little plug to the Dell networking event, which also happens during HIMSS and, and is fantastic. The I'll tell you, last year, the HIMSS Your Turn sessions, which were the sessions that are submitted as the unconference that happens within HIMSS, and I think last year was the first year that they did it, and they allow people to create, um, you know, to submit their ideas in the weeks leading up to HIMSS, and the decisions about which uh, submissions are going to be accepted aren't made until two weeks in advance of the conference. But because they happen after all the other speakers have been chosen and because they are purely, you know, much more audience driven and they are intended to be interactive and engaging, they're not intended to be a lecture. The your right. turn sessions last year were fantastic. Um, I anticipate that they'll be excellent again this year. I definitely would do the interoperability showcase. Absolutely don't miss the interoperability showcase because they will have organizations and groups of organizations that have banded together to show you um, real use cases for healthcare innovations and how new advances with, you know, um, data sharing, for example, are, are transforming our industry. And they'll have multiple vendors in one place who can show you end to end what happens when a patient is on the operating table, when the information about the operation is transmitted to the EMR, it flows downstream through a clearinghouse system to an HIE, and then what happens when it's processed at the HIE and what the other doctor reads. So the interoperability showcase is by far a, a one of my top three don't miss at hymns. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so wait, the, yeah. so getting back to, so that's really interesting. And then your turn, if somebody yeah. wanted to had an idea, what would mm -hmm. they do? Go to hymns and sort of hope that it kind of gets hymns. Picked? HIMSConference.org. There is a submission and it's live through Friday. It is still, they're still taking submissions for the HIMS Your Turn kind of unconference within the HIMS conference. God, see, that's cool. Yes. 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 It I is have... awesome. Okay. Now, um, we have a question here. So many things are extemporaneous at HIMS. How much margin do you suggest leaving open in your <laughs> schedule? And don't need a hers. We definitely need John a is awesome. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's John McBride, and he is amazing. He is the CEO of a Foundria, and so he is the CEO of a really truly innovative wellness company um, who partners with health IT companies. And he's amazing. So John John's awesome. Um, but why doesn't John want to get on? That's what I. He, John, he says he's in transit. I think so. He's on the road. Yeah, but you know, there's a lab app. 
you know that, I think. Yeah, but I definitely don't want to encourage him to, to, to blab and, and drive. <laughs> if, he's, if he's, yeah, blabbing and driving, probably not a good idea. Um, so John, I, I think that you have to plan for, I think you have to plan for almost everything that you're doing at Hims that is not in a structured environment. So if you're not in a session or at a very specific event that you are required to attend, I think almost all of it is extemporaneous. That's a great word. Um, and I think that the only thing that you can plan is internally when you're having conversations with people and you meet them in hallways, when you have these kind of you know, organic moments of connection that happen throughout the conference and everything that, that occurs in between the sessions, you just are, are mindful of the fact that every moment you're spending in that conversation or with that, yeah, you know, with that individual or group of people is a moment that you know, you can't spend 10 feet further down the hallway with another individual or another group of people. And and so just be mindful when those moments happen. Because that's, I, I honestly, I don't plan, I, I don't plan any of the time at HIMSS that I don't absolutely have to. So my strategy for HIMSS is to plan as little as possible and to maximize the amount of organic connections that I can happen, you know, that, that can occur. Um, but that's you have to be mindful. Yep, that's, See, that's it, interesting because based on what you just said, I would not have thought that you would say that. I would have thought yeah. that you would say, okay, and I'm doing no. So in a way, what you're saying is you want to organically connect, but if you realize this is going on too long, it's not productive for them or for me, then you need to find a way to exit yourself out yeah. so that you can. So exactly. So, so a lot of those sort of serendipitous connections could actually benefit both people but once you realize it's not serendipitous or it's not going anywhere, you need to get out. Exactly. That's exactly right. And it's, I mean, I'll tell you, my entire career has been made on serendipitous connections. And so I, I embrace that concept. Um, and I, I firmly believe that, you know, you have to create free time. You have to have free space in order to, to make meaningful connection. And you have to give yourself the opportunity if you're enjoying a conversation and, and every moment of your, every moment of your day is structured, um, then you might not ever have an opportunity to be in that place with those people again, right? Or at least not till the next year. So, you know, as much as you do have to be mindful that those are, you know, that, that you're maximizing the, the time that you have for those types of organic connections, yeah, do them. I mean, just but, don't, but yeah. don't overstructure yourself. And to your point, like even if you're meeting someone, just talking about ideas, you have to be in the moment to sort right. of, okay, they're doing this. And I sort of have an interest in there and there's an overlap. So you have to, yep. I think, not be so rigid and tied to a schedule because your mind has to be able to sort of see connections. And if your mind right. kind of can't see possibility or can't see connections because you're so kind of linear and rigid about your time, then I don't think you ever do have those kind of connections. You can't exactly. see the commonality because finding common ground requires a leap of creativity and a leap of seeing a potential that isn't maybe at there at first glance. So exactly, exactly. And, and so I, I do, I, I try, um, I try to leave as much as my time unstructured at HIMSS as, as possible and, and at most conferences, but at HIMSS in particular, because there are so many opportunities due to the sheer number of people who are there that like it's, it's an unparalleled networking opportunity, but you have to make room for it to happen. Mm. I love that. I yeah. think it's such a great, that's really, I, I think that's, I, I think that's an interesting kind of way if we we're going to end, because I know we we're probably only going to go for an hour, but yeah. are there things that we kind of, and by the way, we do need a hers, because I think yes. women who are in, the, in any kind of space like this are very um, underrepresented. And we could, Mandy, we could have a whole um, blab on that, because there's a whole interesting sort of we dynamic. Could. We you could, and, and there's and there's a, a community, there's an entire community that would get behind having that um, blab, because I think that the suggestion was actually made at, at the Health IT Chicks meeting last year at HIMSS, right? So they did, uh, which is another, by the way, another thing on the don't miss. I think that you, if you're not currently engaged in the Health IT Chicks community, whether you are a man or a woman, I think that it would be important to at least participate in the conversation and understand the issues that are being raised and some of the challenges that are being faced and, and how we're helping each other kind of navigate that space. But the Health IT Chicks tweet up that's at HIMSS is another on the don't miss list. Okay. Um, and yeah, guys but I think that that's back. Too, right? Guys yeah. can go to that as well. Okay. They can. They can. 
Ah, um, you have another. You have, you have another question. Do you recommend focused approach for entrepreneurs? How can entrepreneurs go about networking? Well, we were, I mean, we've, that it's kind of what we've been discussing, don't you think, to some extent? Yeah. I guess the question is networking. We've been talking about networking at conferences as opposed to networking in general. So do you right. see, Mandy, in your experience, do you see any differences? Like an, an entrepreneur in day-to-day -day life, how would that be different from networking at a conference? Is there Are there similarities? Are there differences? I, I think that you... I think that when you are an entrepreneur, especially if you are someone who is um, who is in early stages and is, is always customer facing, you have to always consider yourself as customer facing. And I think it's important to um, recognize that. And I think a lot of, especially the early stage tech companies have founders who are perhaps not um, not as used to dealing with customer facing you know, challenges and opportunities, right? That's not necessarily their forte. They may be very, very skilled, but may not have the same level of exposure when talking and going after money for VCs, for example, or thinking of everyone that they meet as an opportunity for a beta tester or an early adopter or, you know, or even an evangelist for the technology that, they, that they're that um, they bringing into the world. So I do think having a focused approach to networking is important as an entrepreneur. I think you do need to make sure that you research who you'd like to know and who is important to you in your industry both you know who can who who can help you in any way whether it's a, a mentoring perspective whether it's from a VC perspective if you need dollars um, whether it's again the testing community who's your audience who are your primary yeah, who, who are you trying to serve with with your product or service um, but it's it's still important to make time for that serendipity because so much can happen that's entirely unexpected. And so if you only work your plan and don't make time or don't you know don't make room for those organic conversations, then you may miss out on much more interesting opportunities that you didn't expect. Well, the problem with that, I mean, I think I think you're a hundred percent right. The problem is is when you're trying to start something as someone who you know created a I'm a founder as well. Your time is mm -hmm. just, there's just so much that so you limited. have to do. There, literally, yeah. it, it, it's completely mind boggling. You can work 18 hours a day and you're still yeah. never done. And yeah. so when you're in those serendipitous um, or trying to connect with people, in a way, it messes with your head because you're always thinking about, oh my God, I have so much to do. It's a little stressful. So that yeah, I'm just sort of playing devil's advocate. The other thing I do mm -hmm. think though, or any type of entrepreneur, that networking, you have to get used to being rejected. Because yes. if you're, like I know for my business, you, I, yes, you're looking for beta testers, which I'm doing now, looking, you know, considering, thinking about funding, looking at other people who, partners, and it's constant rejection. You'll email 10 people and um, they'll all, nobody will email you back. You'll reach out mm -hmm. and you just have to let that stuff roll off you. And so networking right. for founders and entrepreneurs is a lot of rejection, especially in the early years, because I mean, I don't know. Do you agree with that? Or I don't know. I other do. That, um, I, you know, I, I do. I do. And I and I've I, I'm a I have been a serial entrepreneur and someday I'll be an entrepreneur again. But it's, um, you know, it, it is, again, getting back to the concept of networking as time management and, and understanding that, you know, you you do have to always be aware that there's a finite you know there's a finite opportunity to network there's a finite opportunity for each conversation and um you maximize if there are for example for hims if you go to the show with a goal if you know if, if you are the, the founder of a new health it company if you're the founder of a new fitness app for example and you go to the show with a goal you you need to land another three million dollars in funding you know, this year or else you won't be in business next year. So there are particular types of people that you would gravitate towards, right? There are particular types of sessions that you're going to want to attend so that you can be part of the conversation afterwards standing around at those tables. So make sure that you maximize the time and that you do focus that energy. But when you're having those conversations at the table afterwards, don't forget to listen for related conversations mm -hmm. that might you know that might lead to more opportunity and to something that you hadn't considered. Yeah, you know, so don't don't lose sight of the fact that the space around your focused conversation can have just as much of an impact.
But you know what? I think you just nailed it there. I think that's what it is. You have to know what is your goal. Like I think yep. before you go in, everybody who goes, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're a founder or what is your goal? And then once you have your overarching goal, then essentially all of your agenda should be meeting that goal. You should, I mean, or sort of moving towards that. Who are the people you want to meet? How are you going to, you know, possibly, um, you know, meet those people? What are you going to do? And then it looks like he's having a hard time getting on. So I think yeah, you're not. right. And maybe even kind of narrowing it down to like one part, like you mentioned that entrepreneur, I need to have 3 million by next year. Then it would be about funding. Like that's right. what they're doing. They're just there for funding. If you're there to kind of meet customers, that's different. If you're just there. So it might help the people because I think a lot of entrepreneurs have ADHD. I'm not joking. Or they have a tendency to, you know, yeah. you're running at a mile a minute. And it just, and by the way, that's cool. Like the smart, creative people have ADHD. It might be helpful to just say, here's your one goal. And what are you going to do to kind of, you know, achieve, achieve that goal? Um, exactly. We have Michael, Michael, and it sounds, it looks like Michael is on, but it's not working. At least I'm not hearing you, Michael, if you're talking. Glad you're enjoying it. Yeah. Do you have any questions? As somebody, health data for all is on. And I know, Michael, you, it says your audio is working. Michael, can you hear us? You know what you might do, Michael? You might, um, what helped me when I was having a hard time getting in is I actually went back in through Blab I Am. So don't follow the link. Just go to Blab I Am, the main site, and see what's live, and then click through that. That's what I would do if I were you. That's how I was able to get on. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to wrap up. My daughter is calling me, and I need to go because she's on a she's on a bus to Washington D.C. So I don't want to miss it. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thanks for all your insights, Mandy. Oh, it was great. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Bye. bye. It was great to meet you, Melissa. You. I know. Me too. Okay. Bye. bye.